yesterday, I guess Monday, Friday, Friday, you guys were doing this lab um, where you had to measure the temperature and pressure inside this closed flask. Okay, hopefully you got some good data from that and you were able to get that done. Um, now there was quite a lot going on in here. Now hopefully what you saw where you had some temperatures, I don't know, somewhere probably around two degrees Celsius all the way up to around 98 degrees Celsius because the Celsius scale is set up based on the freezing point and boiling points of water. Zero degrees Celsius is freezing water, 100 degrees Celsius is when water starts to boil. So I'm guessing you had around two, um, 24 degrees and maybe around, uh, I don't know, 40 degrees. Okay, and then your pressures probably range from somewhere around 80 to 114 kilopascals. Not exactly sure, somewhere in there. Okay, now, in order to perform this experiment, what two experimental factors were kept constant? Well, remember, when you started this whole experiment, you put a little stopper in the flask and you closed it. Okay, which means whatever's in here stays in here but nothing else gets in here. So the number of particles, number of particles, as well as the volume, and by that I mean this beaker, this flask, didn't get smaller or bigger. Um, it, the gas particles had to occupy the same amount of space. So number of particles and volume of gas, okay, stayed the same. Based on the data and graph that you obtained for this experiment, express in words the relationship between pressure and temperature. I can't say for sure what your data looks like, but I should look something like this. As temperature goes from around 0 to around 100 degrees, um, this is going to go from around 80 to about 120, I don't know, somewhere in there. And you're going to have a line that looks about like that. And hopefully these points are fairly linear. And what that shows is pressure increases with temperature. Now that shouldn't be surprising. I know you guys have a little bit of background on temperature and what it actually measures, so hopefully you were prepared for this data. Okay, use graphical analysis to get a line that goes to these points. Write the equation below and include units. Now, y equals mx plus b is the standard equation of the line, but your y value over here is pressure, so you had pressure equals the slope m times the temperature, all right, that was what our x values were, plus um, b, which is the temperature, or the pressure, I'm sorry, at zero. So really what I have is pressure equals, and my data that I got from my class was 3.14 times t plus 86, I think, or 80.6, I'd have to look it up now. Okay, But I'm going to go with that. Okay, so that's what I mean when I say units. What I'm trying to get you to do is what's y, y is pressure, what's x, x is temperature. Based on my graph, do I think it's possible for the pressure to reach zero? Well, if we go back and take a look at my data, okay, I can see here at zero degrees the pressure is not zero, but if this line keeps going and it's possible to have negative temperatures, then sure, my line can be extended to reach zero. Yes, if the temp gets cold enough. Okay, and zero degrees Celsius is not low enough, but um, maybe there is a temperature that is. If the pressure was zero, what would this mean about the motion of the gas particles? Now remember, pressure is caused by the particles bouncing off the wall of the container. So if there is no pressure, that means the particles aren't bouncing off the walls of the container anymore, and that means they're all just kind of sitting in one spot. And if that's the case, um, the gas particles are basically not moving. Okay, so the gas particles stop moving. Okay, they're no longer bouncing off the walls. All right, so let's actually solve this equation up here in order to get the temperature, which the pressure would be zero. So I put zero in for pressure equals whatever my slope was, point, or point 0.314 plus 80. And so I'm going to subtract stuff over. And actually in class, I think... Um, we had a uh, temperature around minus 280 degrees Celsius, which is interesting. 
Okay, would it make sense or be possible to have a temperature lower than this value? Well, be, the reason the temperature is this low is because the pressure is zero. And can I have a pressure less than zero? No, I can't have the particles actually start pulling in. That's actually exerting a force and causing a pressure again. So, no, um, the pressure can't be lower than zero. So the temperature can't get lower than this. Okay. Um, so it all comes down to to particle motion. Okay. So I actually have a typo in here. The temperature at which all particle motion stops is called absolute zero. That's true. The accepted value for this is negative 273.15, not negative 272.15. How does your answer compare? Go ahead and get me that now. Okay. That's the lab, and the whole idea of the lab was to introduce absolute zero and why it exists and what it is. But really, what we're doing is we're talking about temperature and thermal energy. And the two are different. Okay, Temperature and thermal energy. When we're talking about thermal energy, we're talking about the energy of the particles that make up matter. Okay, Thermal energy is the energy of the particles. Energy of particles in an object doesn't matter if the object is solid, liquid, or gas. Um, they all have a little bit of motion. They all have a little bit of forces between them. So they all have some kinetic and they all have some potential energy. Okay, so thermal energy is the energy of the particles in an object, which is not temperature. Okay, temperature is a measure of average kinetic energy, of average kinetic energy of the particles. Okay, Now, th the reason um, temperature and thermal energy are so different, thermal energy is actually energy of all the particles in it. Temperature is an average of the kinetic energy of the particles, which means two different objects at, at the same temperature, like a giant block of iron and a small block of iron, at the same temperature have the same, don't have the same thermal energy, right? Um, if I want a small block of iron to have the same thermal energy as a large block of iron, then the small one actually needs to be warmer. But their temperatures can be the same because temperature is an average of the kinetic energy of the particles. So you take the, the total kinetic energy divided by the total number of particles and we get the temperature, or at least a quantity related to the temperature. So what? how do we actually measure ter temperature and what's the deal with thermometers? Right. Well, thermometers don't actually measure the temperature of something else. Thermometers rely on changes to work. Okay, And basically, the warmer an object gets, the more the particles move. So expansion. Okay, When you actually put a liquid-based thermometer, like mercury or alcohol, into something warm, the particles expand and take up more space. Expansion is one of them. When you use a temperature probe, it works because resistance changes. Um, the warmer it gets, the harder it is for current to flow. Um, and so we can measure a voltage difference and convert it to a temperature. Another one that we see a lot is color. When things get warm, they tend to change color. So thermometers rely on changes of work, whether it's expansion, resistance, or color. And they actually they only measure their own temperature. They measure their own temperature. Okay, And so what actually happens is when you put a thermometer into something, heat or energy, right? Heat and energy are like the same thing, flows into or out of, okay, depending on which way it's going, out of the thermometer until they reach what's called thermal equilibrium, basically until they're the same temperature. And that's because temp depends on kinetic energy of the particles. So if they have more kinetic energy, they move more, they're going to collide more often, right? So heat flows from hot to cold because of particle motion. Okay? And it's collisions and things like that. Now, we use a bunch of different scales to measure temperature. Okay? Fahrenheit, which is what we still use, was the first one to actually give us a standardized scale, which is why his is used at all, really. Um, he was the first one to do it. And it goes from zero, 
which is the freezing point of water with um, antifreeze in it, all the way up to 212 degrees, which is the boiling point of water. So usually we, we say the Fahrenheit scale goes 32 to 212, and that's freezing to boiling based on water. The Celsius scale, which is the scale we use in science, is also based on water, but it goes 0 to 100 degrees, okay, and so it's based on water. Now what you guys just found was absolute zero in lab, and absolute zero, or the absolute scale, is the Kelvin scale, and zero on it, there is no such thing as colder, so we can have negative temperature. We can have negative temperature, okay, and the reason we don't really like to use a negative temperature is because if temperature is measuring the kinetic energy or the average kinetic energy of an object, it doesn't make sense to have negative kinetic energy, right? It's one half mv squared. You can't have negative mass, and if you square velocity, it's always going to be positive. Okay? So the Kelvin scale exists so that we can have a zero and nothing lower. No negative. Okay? And the Kelvin scale was set up based on the Celsius scale. So a change of one degree Celsius is equal to a change of one Kelvin. Now they're not degrees Kelvin, they're Kelvins. Okay, so zero is absolute zero. Okay, if you want the freezing point of water, you've got to add 273.15 degrees to that. Okay, so zero degrees Celsius equals 273.15 Kelvin, and if I add one over here, then I add one over here. So uh, 100 degrees Celsius equals 200 or 373.15 Kelvin. Okay? A change of 1 degree Celsius is a change of 1 Kelvin. That's not the same with Fahrenheit. Remember, on the Celsius Fahrenheit scale, um, degrees Celsius equals degrees Fahrenheit minus 32 times 5 ninths, or if you'd prefer that the other way, degrees Fahrenheit equals nine-fifths of a degree Celsius plus 32. Okay, So there's your conversion there. Now there is a temperature which degrees Celsius and degrees uh, Fahrenheit are the same. There is one temperature. Alright, um, so we've got temperature, we've got pressure, we've got absolute zero, and we know that temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of the of the particles that make up an object. Thermal energy is the total energy of the particles that make up an object. So they're a little bit different and we'll explore that tomorrow. Today what I want you guys to do is take a look in your book um, on page 317. I want you to do 1 and 2 okay? and they're pretty straightforward problems but I also want 36 through 40 on page 336. Page 336, 36 through 40. And just for fun, what I want you to do is find the temp at which um, degrees Fahrenheit equals degrees Celsius. So they're the same temperature. And I also want um, find absolute zero absolute zero in degrees Fahrenheit. Okay? Alright, good luck. Let me know if you have any trouble and be sure to reference your book. We are in chapter 12 so um, there's some things in there if you're, if you're a little bit stuck you can, you can look in chapter 12 section 1.